Hello everyone, welcome to Supply Chain Management and in this lecture and this module we're going to deal with aggregate planning. So aggregate planning it comes directly after forecasting. Your output, your forecast becomes your input for aggregate planning and in aggregate planning you're going to plan for the next six months, three months or a year about what you need to produce what your production plan is going to be, how many employees do you need, what you need to put in inventory. So this is all about managing your capacity. So let's review very quickly what aggregate planning is. It essentially is a plan to help firms best use the facilities it has. And the goal here is to maximize your profit. So we determine levels of capacity, production, subcontracting, inventory, stockouts, and pricing over a time horizon. And we look at the different parameters over that time horizon. Uh, the parameters include production rate, workforce over time, machine level capacity, subcontracting, backlog, and inventory at hand. The time frame we're looking at is about three to 18 months. More usually it's about people use about half a year to a year. Now the decisions made with aggregate plan, remember it's aggregated, that is it's grouped together. It's not at an SKU or stock, stock keeping unit level, but it's as a product family level. And all stages in the supply chain should work on the aggregate plan together to optimize the supply chain. So let's look at the problem. So the first thing is before you start an aggregate plan is you need to know the demand forecast. So the demand forecast for that planning period. And once you have that, you can figure out the production level, the inventory level, the capacity level, and the total profit. We're trying to maximize the firm's on supply chain's profit over that horizon. So we've got to figure out what the planning horizon is the duration of each period, and specify key information required to develop an aggregate plan. So what do we need to do for aggregate planning? First, we need the forecasts, right? Then you need to have the production costs. You need labor costs. What are your regular time costs? What's your overtime costs? Those are dollars per hour. Your subcontracting costs, either in dollars per hour or dollars per unit. The cost of changing capacity, hiring and firing workers. Now remember, you can change capacity by increasing the, num the machinery. You have more machines, but that's going to be hard. It's easier to add and fire workers in a short-term planning horizon. Uh, fixed costs or you know, the capital investment in machinery could be very expensive. Now this is not necessarily so, but in a lot of manufacturing places, that is the truth. Then you have to know the labor per machine hours required per unit, right? So how much, how many hours do you need uh, for a unit? Inventory holding costs, dollars per unit per period, stock out or backlog costs. And then you have constraints over time, layoffs, capital available, stock outs, backlogs from suppliers. These are all limitations to the plan. So what do we get from an aggregate plan? That is the output. We get the production quantity from regular time, overtime, and subcontracted time, the inventory held, black log or stock out con quantity, workforce hired or layered off, machine capacity increased or decreased, and a poor aggregate plan can result in lost sales, lost profit, excess inventory, or excess capacity. So it's important we have a good aggregate plan. So here is an example. We are going to use this example from the book and we're going to use it to figure out what our aggregate unit should be. The aggregate unit should be identified in a way that result that the resulting production schedule can be accomplished in practice. And we focus on the bottlenecks when selecting the aggregate unit and identifying the capacity and production times and we have to account for activities such as setups and maintenance. So here is a group 
Red Tomato Tools does gardening equipment, and it has product families A, B, C, D, E, and F, right? And here are the material costs, here are the revenue per unit, here's the setup time, average batch size, production time per unit, net production time, and percentage share of units sold. Now, based on this, we can actually calculate the aggregate uh, values for this. So we use the weighted average approach, the material cost per aggregate unit. So we take each one of the material costs and we multiply it by the percentage of shares. So this is 15 multiplied by 0.1 plus 7 multiplied by 0.25, which will give us the aggregate or weighted average material cost of $10 per unit. The revenue per aggregate unit, again, this is the weighted average, which gives you 40. Net production time per aggregate unit, again, we get that. So you get the idea of how to calculate these aggregate values, okay? And once you calculate the aggregate values, you have the numbers which you need to do the work of aggregate planning. Now, I want to talk to you about three theoretical strategies. Now. In, for the project, you're going to do a hybrid method. You're not going to essentially do what we call as pure strategies. Uh, but these pure strategies are important for you to understand the levers you have to manipulate capacity. Here are the three ways you can manipulate capacity. Okay, And there are trade-offs. So you can manipulate capacity, inventory, or backlog of sales, right? So the first strategy is called chase strategy. And here we are using capacity as a lever. And we'll talk more about it in detail. Then you have the flexibility strategy where you use utilization. You manipulate utilization as the lever. And then there's a level strategy where inventory is the lever. And then finally, which is a tailored or hybrid strategy, which is a combination of all three. And in reality, when you run your optimization, this is where you're going to be. So let's look at this chase strategy. This is also called hiring and hire and fire strategy. We vary machine capacity or hire and layoff workers as demand varies. Now it's often difficult to vary capacity and workforce in short notice, especially the more skilled workers you need, the more expensive and more difficult it can get. Uh, and it's expensive, the cost of varying capacity is high and it has a negative effect on workforce morale but it does result in low levels of inventory and it's used when inventory holding costs are high and costs of changing capacity are low. This is often used in agriculture. Either during harvest season, you hire more workers and then after harvest season, they are temporary workers and then you lay them off, right? And this, you need to do that because when you do agricultural products, they are perishable products. So when you need to get them, you need to get them in that short period of time, you need to surge in your capacity, right? And this does result in low levels of inventory because you can't store fresh goods for a long time. And therefore inventory holding costs are high and the cost of changing capacity because it's essentially unskilled labor, the cost of changing capacity is low. Time flexibility strategy uses excess machine capacity. Here we keep workforce stable and the number of hours worked varies. We use overtime or flexible work schedule or schedule uh, to handle that capacity. So flexible workforce avoids morale problems. It results in low levels of inventory and lower utilization, which gives us some buffer. When you have excess machine capacity, you have some buffer. And it's used when inventory holding costs are high and capacity is relatively inexpensive. All right. That's the time flexibility strategy. The third strategy is called the level strategy. Here we are keeping our machine capacity stable. We're going to produce at a very stable level. Workforce is also stable, constant output rates, but inventory levels fluctuate at times. In high demand times, we withdraw from the inventory. In low demand times, we build our inventory. So inventory is carried over. It is much better for worker morale. 
and it results in large inventories and if if allowed backlogs may accumulate and there is a chance if you if your if your industry or the product you're selling does not allow backlogs you might end up having stockouts so it's used when inventory holding costs and backlog costs are relatively low you don't do this when the cost of that single unit of a product is very very expensive so let's assume that you are GE healthcare and you are producing these magnets which are half a million dollars you cannot have large inventory because if sales goes down or plummets you have huge value in your inventory right so you have to have inventory and backlog costs which are relatively low so these are the strategies we're going to stop right here and in the next lecture we're going to talk about how we're going to do a hybrid model and then how are we going to get the best solution using linear programming.